Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker at OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, we're very pleased you could be with us today for this webinar. Um, and we're really pleased to have Matt Simon, who's a science journalist at Wired on with us today to talk about his new book, A Poison Like No Other, How, how Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies. Uh, this book was published by Island Press, and I'll put a link in the chat for everyone um, so you can see, to, so you can access, know where to get the book. Uh, and before we get started, I wanted to let you know how this webinar is going to run. Uh, we'll have Matt giving a presentation. Um, there'll be a bit of a focus on the ocean, on ocean science and how the, the um, microplastics are research got started in the ocean, given um, octos uh, and all of your um, foci. But um, we'll, after the presentation, we'll launch into questions. Um, you are, you can send in questions either through the question panel um, and also through the chat. Uh, now the chat is available so that you can send in um, comments and commentary to everyone as well as let other people see your questions. It's your choice. You can send it to just me, you could send it to me and Matt, or you could uh, let everyone view it. Uh, we just ask that you keep it professional in the chat and I'll keep it to the topic. Um, so Matt, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'll turn it over Certainly. to you now. Thank you. Yeah, I wish we could all be meeting under better circumstances, um, but I have not particularly great news about uh, microplastics. And I think it would be helpful if we started out with some definition. So we're all, of course, familiar with macroplastics, that being the bottles and bags that we know a lot of organisms are ingesting like turtles. Um, microplastic was really, the, the definition at least, was dreamed up as, as okay, while well, we have a lot of other organisms out there that are much smaller, um, what size plastics might they be ingesting? And, and scientists landed on this definition of microplastics as bits smaller than five millimeters. That's about the width of a pencil eraser. And that is the right size for way more organisms to ingest, um, in particular, plankton, which are just at this scale. Uh, and that's one of the major concerns uh, among oceanographers about the ways that microplastics are influencing these ecosystems. Uh, but they get even smaller. So we have now something called nanoplastics. And as these microplastics fragment into smaller and smaller pieces, they get down to the nanoscale. That's typically defined as bits smaller than a micron. There's some debate about what that, that threshold should actually be. These are small enough to not only get into individual uh, plankton, little tiny animals, but also individual cells. Uh, that includes in our bodies as well, which we'll get to later. But these are the definitional things to, to get out of the way first. These are the sizes that we're talking about. Um, and really we'll be talking about kind of all three categories uh, throughout this. Um, here's the fundamental issue with plastic is that the plastics industry is not required in any way to tell us what is in this stuff. There is no ingredient list for the plastic bottle on your desk or the clothes that you wear that are now made out of polyester and nylon. Those are plastic fab fibers. And we are just not sure as a public what is in this stuff. So it's up to chemists, unfortunately, to reverse engineer essentially a lot of these different kinds of plastics and say, okay, this is what we know is in it. They're landing at around 10,500, at least different chemicals in plastics, many of which are known to be toxic uh, for a range of organisms, be they in the ocean, on the land, uh, microbes, uh, all the way up to humans as well. And when these microplastics are breaking apart in the environment, the bonds are snapping. It's a very tough material by design, obviously, but um, as those bonds snap, these chemicals start to escape and leach out, and that doses, unfortunately, whatever is in the vicinity. What we do know about 
plastics is that they're made of fossil fuels. Um, the vast, vast majority, at least 99% of them are, are still made from fossil fuels. And every step of the way of producing these plastics comes with emissions. So it takes a lot of energy to extract those fossil fuels in the first place. And you then have to turn those fossil fuels into these plastics. Uh, and then once these plastics escape into the environment, they actually off gas a lot of that carbon, especially as methane, which is a extremely potent greenhouse gas. And what you're seeing here is a, a graphic uh, showing, projecting forward, given the growth of the plastics industry, what we'll be looking at in 2050, uh, which is something on the order of 600 coal plants equivalent uh, just from the plastics industry. So this is the, the brutal reality is that as we're actually making progress decarbonizing our economy by shutting down coal-fired plants, plastics is coming up more and more. Um, not necessarily burning coal, but producing uh, enough emissions to equal about 600 coal plants by 2050. Uh, it's it's this huge shift in the fossil fuel industry. They know the writing on the wall is that we're going to stop using fossil fuels as fuels and start using more of them as plastics. It's fossil fuels in a different form. It's a sneaky way for them to go about this, uh, but that's really the, the big thing that we're up against as plastics production continues to grow exponentially year after year. Um, that is the challenge. Uh, so talking about sources of microplastics, this is the big one. We've all heard of microbeads. Uh, these were banned in the US a number of years ago. Unfortunately, that didn't go far enough. That was banning products that are wash off products. So facial scrubs and different kinds of soaps that had these microbeads in them. It did not ban the other use of microbeads, which is in cosmetics. Um, things like mascara, eyeliner, um, go on smoothly a lot of times because of these microbeads are acting essentially like ball bearings, it's making them smooth over your face. Uh, there's nothing regulating that. So when you wash your face, uh, not that you should feel bad about wearing makeup because it's not your fault at all. That's a thing that we'll get to later on. But uh, this is another sneaky way that the plastics industry is just infiltrating every aspect of our lives with microplastic. And then by extension, all of these microplastics eventually escaping into the environment. The other massive source of microplastics is our clothing. Uh, some two thirds of clothing is now made out of plastic. Again, polyester, nylon, that sort of thing. And even natural fibers now like cotton and wool are often coated with polymers to make them waterproof. So even if we were to switch to all natural fibers again, like wear togas like the Greeks and Romans once more. Uh, unfortunately, those natural fibers are now processed in such a way that makes them plastic like. Uh, and one of the calculations you can see here is that since 1950, the equivalent of something like 7 billion fleece jackets have escaped our washing machines and flown to water bodies um, as these little tiny bits. They're not jackets in and of themselves, but put them all together. That's the scale that we're talking about here. Um, it's a huge issue in part because washing machine manufacturers are not required to put these microfiber filters on their machines in any way. Uh, but France is actually leading the way here. They are now mandating that by 2025, all washing machines must come with filters like we have on our dryers, these, these lint filters, but filters in the washing machine to keep these things from flushing to wastewater treatment facilities. The other sneaky one is tires. Tires are made out of synthetic rubber now. Synthetic rubber is a kind of plastic and the little particles that come off are classified as microplastics, which you can see here. Uh, the one on the right is actually particularly interesting because it um, gets at a study that looked at, okay, well, once these come off of tires, what do they do as they're tumbling down the road? And that rough, kind of bumpy, almost bulbous structure is sticky and it actually picks up extra pollutants on the road as it's tumbling around. And there has been some recent, recent research coming out of University of Washington that has linked tire microplastics to mass die-offs of salmon in rivers there. These are washing off of roads in significant quantities, especially after the first rain of the season. And that is dosing the salmon with a particular chemical called 6-PPD um, that leads to mass die-offs. That is one species that we know about that is affected by microplastics. And additional studies since then have linked this other chemical, this chemical to other die-offs of fish. Uh, and God knows how many other species we're just missing because we're just beginning to scratch the surface of 
the impacts of microplastics on uh, freshwater ecosystems in particular. Another sneaky one, paint. Paint has plastic in it, it's polymer. Um, so that, that middle top image is a, of a bridge of some sort. Bridges as they weather in the environment emit all those little tiny pieces of, of, of paint that is plastic. I live in San Francisco, we have the Golden Gate Bridge, which is famously painted very frequently because of the weather conditions here. Uh, where's that paint going? When it wears off, it's going straight down into the bay. Um, and these are microplastics just in a different form than we're used to. Also, when ships are repainted at dock, they're sandblasted first. So that washes a bunch of these particles into these harbors. And scientists are showing more and more that harbors and ports are particularly polluted with, with microplastics of all kinds. Yet another sneaky one, cigarette butts. We throw away trillions of them every year directly into the environment and when they accumulate in gutters and then wash out to sea. Uh, these are made out of synthetic fibers, uh, tens of thousands of them in a single cigarette butt. Uh, when cigarette smokers step on them, when they throw them out, that primes the, the cigarette butt to disintegrate. And it does so into microplastics, which then wash out to water bodies. Uh, ocean beach cleanups, you're probably aware, one of the most consistently found items is, is cigarette butts. It's, it's at the top because we're throwing so many of them directly into the environment. It's just this normal thing that we do. I'd say we, uh, the, the smokers do, but they just toss them as if it means something. It's, it's plastic and it is accumulating in water bodies in particular. Nurdles. Nurdles are a funny name for a very unfunny concept. Um, nurdles are these little pellets that are melted down into plastic products. Uh, it's it's the, basically the raw form of plastic that then becomes bottles and bags. Unfortunately, these are extremely easy to lose along the supply chain as they're moving between different parts of the supply chain. Very easy to spill and they spill in significant quantities, hundreds of millions of pounds into the ocean. Each year, this is a particular problem in the United States and the Gulf Coast, where there's a lot of plastics production facilities. Um, a number of nurdle companies have been sued in recent years for losing so many of these nurdles into the environment, um, just in just astonishing numbers, millions and millions of pounds. And here's the ecological problem with nurdles in particular. Uh, left are fish eggs and at right are nurdles. They look almost exactly the same. Um, this is a huge concern among oceanographers that nurdles in particular are being mistaken for actual food for predators, uh, fish larvae, things like that, that are eating other fish eggs for food. Uh, and when they do that, they are filling up their bellies with this inedible object and decreasing their appetite for actual food. Uh, actually, one of the first papers on microplastics came out in the early 70s, um, and when they found these fish with a bunch of these nurdles in their bellies and, and commented at the time, well, that, this seems rather problematic that these fish are accumulating them in their stomachs. Uh, what does that mean for how much they're actually eating of proper food? Um, that was, you know, 50 years ago now, and fish are eating more and more of these things because we're pumping more and more into the environment as plastic production increases exponentially. Uh, this is a little video, hopefully it plays, that, that shows, I think, really a kind of stunning extent of the problem. Um, I, we don't need the dramatic music here. Uh, these are plankton, and those are little tiny microbeads that are made fluorescent by the researchers to show their path through the digestive system of these plankton. Um, as you can see here, moving quite easily and gathering in the gut where they would decrease appetite for actual food. Um, this is happening on tremendous scales when you think about the base of the oceanic food web being these plankton, um, potentially greatly reducing their appetite for actual food. In addition to any number of the chemicals, again, over 10,000 in plastics, any one of which might have a detrimental effect on a particular species of plankton. And we know very little about what that might be doing to populations out in the wild. But here's, a, I think, a, a very nuanced and interesting concern uh, with, with copepods in particular. This was a, a separate study. And at the top, you can see a, a copepod pellet shaped like a banana. Those little spheres are 
uh, microplastic pellets. And when these researchers fed the microbeads to these animals, the, the poop that came out the other end was much lighter because plastics are much less dense than a lot of materials out in nature. And that changes the buoyancy of those pellets. Uh, this has major implications for the carbon cycle. So this is a huge way that carbon is pulled from the atmosphere, uh, put into phytoplankton, eaten by copepods, which poop the carbon down, to be sinking to the seafloor, at least a good amount of it, and being sequestered there. That is pulling carbon from one atmosphere down into the depths. But if these pellets are slowing down because they're loaded with plastics that these copepods are ingesting, that gives more time for organisms farther down the water column to, to eat that and to keep that carbon from reaching the bottom where it can be locked away uh, for longer periods of time. That's a, that's a major concern for the carbon cycle. Obviously, with climate change, we need the oceans to be doing as much work as it possibly can in sequestering carbon to save us from our, ourselves. And I would just point you for other really good videos on this of, of plankton literally choking on microplastic fibers. Uh, plankton Pundit on Twitter has a, a bunch of these. I, I highly recommend it. All right, so other oceanic organisms, uh, birds in particular, this is from a, a recent study that was, I think, quite alarming. So finding, first of all, macroplastics, again, that's the stuff bigger than five millimeters, microplastics smaller than five millimeters. Um, they were finding these microplastics in significant quantities in the organs, even in the absence of microplastics in the gut. So they are showing a lot of tissue damage um, and speculating that this can be very, very terrible for oceanic birds in particular, uh, which is to say nothing of, of the mac macroplastics that they're ingesting. When that happens, those break into microplastics in the gut, which further loads the body with these smaller particles. Birds are also kind of this interesting um, transport mechanism for microplastics in that they eat them and then travel great distances and poop them out. And that uh, adds microplastics to different kinds of environments. There's something else like, among the many things to consider about the ways that microplastics are both moving through organisms and moving through the environment. Uh, the oceans, as you're probably aware, are positively loaded with microplastic now. We are all used to the images of bottles and bags floating around, um, but essentially every cubic inch of the ocean is loaded with microplastics now. Uh, one study found an average of 8,300 particles per liter of seawater. And I want to stress that when these studies are doing their quantifications of the amount of microplastics in seawater, ocean sediment, that sort of thing, uh, those are almost certainly undercounts because you can only count down to a certain size with a certain kind of equipment. But look at the nanoscale, it's very expensive still and very difficult to find those very smallest particles, which there are much more of out there just because of their smaller size. So we're vastly undercounting the microplastics in any of these sort of quantifications in the ocean, but we can say for certain that it is absolutely loaded with tiny, tiny particles of plastic now. This is from a, a great study a couple of years ago that uh, sifted through ocean sediments off the coast of Southern California. And they found that by looking back over the years, they took the sediment core, you can look back, uh, back to the 1940s, and they found all these little particles going back decades, almost, almost 100 years at this point. Um, they were also able to show that as the decades have gone on, there has been an exponential rise in the amount of microplastics in these ocean sediments. And think back to what I was saying earlier, the fossil fuel industry's bet on plastics going forward is to massively ramp up production. That exponential curve is going nowhere but up. It is looking almost at this point like a straight line. Um, and as the production goes up, so too does the contamination of microplastics throughout the environment, be that in ocean sediments, uh, in the water itself, in the land, uh, in the air, that's all going up exponentially as well. That's the urgency here. These would be, I think, because uh, they are really beautiful images, um, uh, if not for kind of the scary implications here. So there is this burgeoning field that looks at something called the plastosphere, which is in these microplastics as they're floating around the environment, they act as 
substrates for these really fascinating communities of microbes to attach to. So you can see some of those in these scanning electron microscope uh, images here. It's actually quite beautiful. The one at lower left, you can see there's like an inset that is bacteria growing on another organism. So there's organisms on organisms within these really diverse communities of uh, microbes on microplastics. Unfortunately, scientists are also finding human pathogens on microplastics in the wild, um, including Vibrio, which is a, a pretty terrible one. Um, and they're also just beginning to study how this community actually transforms as it moves between different parts of the ocean. So these things can travel thousands of miles on, on ocean currents. Are they transporting certain microorganisms to environments where they don't belong? That's a kind of a bridging field of research that certainly requires much more attention. Um, this is, it's a brand new ecosystem on earth that unfortunately created with, with microplastic pollution getting so out of control for so many decades now. All right, a spot of good news. So when I was talking about, we do our laundry, we wash that water out to a wastewater treatment facility. Um, Something like 90% of those fibers are actually caught at the uh, the wastewater treatment facility. The remaining 10% is unfortunately flushed out to sea in uh, relatively clean water, at least according to the government. Um, and that then contaminates oceans, but at least it's not 100% of those microfibers getting out to sea. And because this is by nature, I have bad news as well. So the 90% that is sequestered at the wastewater treatment facility is sequestered in something called sludge. This is human waste that is then applied to fields as fertilizer. It's disinfected first as, as best they're able, but then is applied to our crops. And we are now essentially applying concentrated microplastics to our fields. Uh, one estimate was looking at just Europe applying maybe a billion pounds of microplastic each year to fields, just because so much of the stuff is coming off of so many clothes and so many washing machines, uh, just the scale is unfathomable at this point. We don't have a good idea of what this is doing to crops. Um, some studies have shown that these particles can be uptaken into the roots and then move into the tissues, which would mean that we're eating microplastics in our foods. Um, surprisingly, not a lot of studies that have looked at fresh produce, uh, whether it's in there. Um, we also have to think about all the soil uh, organisms that that keep our soils healthy, like earthworms. There have been very good studies that have shown when exposed to microplastics, earthworms suffer tremendously. They they lose a lot of weight. They don't breed as much. They live much less long as long as as their counterparts who are not exposed to microplastics. So we could be changing also microbial communities in the soil, um, as well as the the physical structure of the dirt changes when you add this very undense material that is plastic, it actually makes it so the soil doesn't absorb as much water, um, which is, of course, an issue if that is then evaporating away, especially where I am in the Western United States, where we are in the midst of a, a terrible drought. So all these really troubling knock-on implications for microplastics that scientists are, are just starting to explore. Uh, I hope you appreciate this picture because I hiked up a mountain to to take it. Uh, I went to a remote mountaintop in Utah with a researcher named Janice Brainy. She has positioned these little collecting devices uh, across mountaintops in the remote western United States because a tremendous amount of microplastic is falling out of the sky. Um, they, her and her colleagues put together a paper in science a couple of years ago and calculated this, that in just 6% of the total U.S. land area in these remote stretches of the, the Western United States, the equivalent of 300 million plastic bottles fall out of the sky each year as microplastic. And when you scale that up to the whole United States, that would mean billions of plastic bottles are falling on our heads each year as microplastics. And again, not even counting nanoplastics. She wasn't going down to the nanoscale in this calculation, but in, in recent years, others have started to do that. And in the remote Alps, they're finding billions of nanoplastics on a square foot of snow every week. Uh, the atmosphere is fundamentally saturated with plastic at this point. Um, and again, 
whenever you see a count of this much microplastic in the air, it's very likely an undercount unless they're considering nanoplastics, but that remains very difficult and very expensive to do. So this microplastic cycle is starting to come into view and the ocean plays a, a, a really big part here. So for decades now, we have been flushing microfibers in particular to the ocean, but also tire microplastics are flushing into bodies of water as well. And as you probably know, the, the really the research on microplastics began in the oceans and has since, since expanded to the atmosphere um, and the other compartments that we see here. So um, you'll notice that sea spray, uh, at least in the Western United States, accounts for 11% of microplastics in the atmosphere. This is a, I think a fascinating um, process happening here that was just brought to light a couple of years ago. So when bubbles come up from the depth, they gather a bunch of organic material like viruses, bacteria, that sort of thing. They pop at the surface and fling that material into the air, which then becomes a component of sea spray. And researchers were able to show that microplastics are now going along for the ride. And they are popping as bubbles being flung into the air uh, along coast and really out throughout entire oceans and taken up into the atmosphere and blown back on land. Um, so Janice Brainy is, is thinking that the oceans have now become so saturated with microplastics over, again, just un, decades of unchecked emissions of microplastics into the ocean, that the ocean is now actually giving the land more microplastics through this process um, than we are blowing microplastics from the land into the ocean. Um, but I think this, this illustration from one of her papers illustrates this, this quite nicely, these cycles that are happening. So you're getting a top left, long range transport where the things are blowing for thousands of miles. They are not just blowing into the Western United States. We are finding tire particles in Arctic snow that is blowing from Europe. And you'll notice down at bottom right, um, braking and road emissions account for 84% here uh, of the microplastic in the atmosphere in the Western United States, according to Genesis calculations, um, because in, these long stretches of highways in particular, we get cars going very fast, they provide the energy to kick up these particles high into the atmosphere where winds gather them up and then just blow them farther up into the atmosphere and across vast distances. Um, you know, it's kind of, kind of actually quite interestingly, the dust near urban centers um, is responsible for very little of it according to her calculations. And that's because there is less of that fast traffic um, in city centers. Uh, when you get outside the city in highways where you're doing 70 miles an hour, it's much more energy to blast these particles into the atmosphere. So there are tons of microplastics obviously in cities, but they seem to tend to stick around um, more so than they do in these stretches outside of cities where you have cars traveling much faster. Um, and then just lastly, you'll see solid waste application to agriculture, soil emissions, Southern landfill plastics, we have recycled less than 10% of it um, throughout history, is sitting in landfills rotting. Uh, in the sun, UV radiation is one of the things, the main things that, that breaks down plastics quite easily. Um, so this is the microplastic cycle, and, and it's really only come to light in the past year or two as scientists are gathering more data, like in those remote stretches of the Western United States, of just how much of the stuff is falling out of the sky, but also just how much of the stuff is coming out of the ocean because again we have spent almost 100 years now just loading the the water with with microplastics microfibers in particular from our clothing so that's i i think terrible news catastrophic news for the environment um but i think for human health the more worrying thing is indoor air um which can be depending on the calculation maybe six times more polluted with microplastics than what's blowing around outside. Because if you look around you right now, carpet is made out of plastic. Your clothing is made out of plastic. Um, just any number of, of articles around you right now are shedding microplastics as they age. One calculation found that we are shedding perhaps a billion particles a year from our synthetic clothing just by walking around, just by the abrasion of our clothing. Um, that all then falls onto the floor 
hundreds of thousands of particles. They've, they've done studies where they've put catchers on the ground to, to show just how much of the stuff is, is falling onto the floor. That means we are inhaling a lot of this, unfortunately. Uh, 7,000 perhaps a day, microplastics a day, according to one estimate. Again, not including nanoplastics, which haven't really been tested that much in the home. Um, this is where you are right now, where I am right now, is one of the most polluted places with microplastics that you could possibly be safe for if you worked in a textile factory or something like that. This has been a sneaking problem because the vast majority of people, I don't think, realize that in particular, their clothes are now made of plastic. Again, two thirds of textiles are these days. Um, there are just these sneaky ways that plastics have infiltrated every corner of our lives. And this whole time, they have been shedding little bits of themselves. Um, and we are just beginning to scratch the surface on the human health studies, but the early implications are extremely worrying because we're finding them throughout the human body. Um, the vast majority of, of tissue samples are coming back positive for, for microplastics. They've been found in the lungs, obviously. We're breathing in a lot of them, but also the gut. We're eating lots of them. Um, one very limited study, I, necessarily limited, I, I'm not criticizing the study, but looked at just a, just a handful of foods that we have actual data on as far as microplastic contamination is concerned. So it wasn't looking at fresh food, it wasn't looking at meat, uh, that sort of thing, but like mostly the packaged food and the bottled water that we're drinking, uh, would they calculate that we're consuming perhaps 50,000 particles a year? And when researchers look at feces samples, human feces samples, they find much more um, that would suggest we're eating millions of particles a year in addition to the stuff that we're breathing. So um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we're also finding the particles in human blood and breast milk. Um, but I think perhaps most worrying is the placenta. And that, that's the images that you see at right. Those are little bits of plastic um, pulled out of human placentas. The particularly concerning class of chemicals here are endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, also known as EDCs. Um, these are chemicals, like a broad range of chemicals that mess with the way our home hormones work in our body and do it in this really, I think, insidious way in that their dosing is strange because you can have a, a pretty small amount of these be very, very toxic, but the toxicity drops off um, as the dose goes up. But then as the dose gets even higher, it comes back up again, it's this U curve. So even in very, very small amounts, like we're exposing children to in the womb, it could be potentially terrible, especially for them, given that their bodies are still developing. Um, the human health side of this stuff is, is very early days, but there have been some very good studies in the past year or so, really, that have started to link particular chemicals in plastics to early death. So phthalates, um, one, uh, according to one calculation, 10,000 premature deaths in the US each year. That was a conservative estimate, um, these things are known toxic. So while we're missing a lot of the data that we need on how specifically microplastics might be affecting human health, we know for certain that they are loaded with a ton of toxic chemicals uh, that are proven detrimental to human health. That's especially true for, for children and, um, and children, especially in the womb. So uh, these plastics have been found in uh, infants first feces, which means they're getting dosed in utero. Um, we then, from the moment they're born, start feeding them plastics, unfortunately, unknowing that I'm not blaming parents. This has been an unknowing thing. It was just a couple of years ago that a study came out that found that when you prepare infant formula in a plastic bottle, those are the perfect conditions to blow apart that plastic. Plastic doesn't like heat and it doesn't like UV radiation. Um, there's a perfect distance to start flaking off little bits of plastic. And this study actually took some, some terrifying images um, that could actually show the way that the plastic had been etching away. It was like the canyon, uh, like the Grand Canyon, the walls of it. It just, it looked like it had been eroding away. Those plastics are going into the infant formula and they're going into our children, um, millions of them a day. Um, just because parents were, didn't had no idea this was happening. So obviously getting away from that, preparing infant formula in glass containers instead. But then once 
kids are, are off of bottles, they're further exposed to microplastics because again, hundreds of thousands of them might fall on a living room floor each day. And toddlers are of course crawling around on that floor. So it's extremely critical that people vacuum as much as they can, but also are very careful with the ways that they dispose of that plastic, um, just so you're not just willy-nilly throwing in the trash can and just getting kicked back up into the air. Again, um, the early human health studies are very concerning. It's, it's not definitive yet the ways that microplastics are terrible for human health, but we know enough to be very concerned. And we know enough to say that these plastics are for sure not good to have in our bodies, especially given the known toxins that are in, in many of them that actually work on very small doses. Uh, so I want to go through some of these very scary graphs to me. Uh, this is plastic waste generated. That's the, the black line, again, going up almost as a straight line at this point. Um, the plastics industry is doubling down on, on generation because that makes them a lot of money. You can barely see it, but down at the bottom is a gray line. Um, I guess it's blue, uh, kind of bluish. That is recycled. Um, less than 10% of plastic items have been recycled around the world. There was a recent study that found in the US that is now 5%. 5% of plastic is recycled, which is absurd. And that is largely due to the fact that plastic recycling isn't profitable. It's difficult to recycle all these plastics because a lot of them have become very complicated. So like a a plastic pouch of baby food isn't a simple plastic pouch. It's multi-layered. It's got a different cap on it. Very difficult to recycle. So what we've been doing in the developed world is shipping the plastic that we can't profitably recycle to developing nations where they are drowning in this stuff, burning a lot of it to get rid of it because there's mountains of this stuff accumulating. That, of course, doses everybody in the vicinity with terrible chemicals but also that rising hot air fires microplastics into the atmosphere. Uh, recycling is a failure. It was a, it's a, we should call it a lie. It was a lie peddled by the plastics industry to dump responsibility onto consumers as we're the ones who created this problem because we're not recycling enough. Don't mind us, the, the plastics industry that has been making this stuff out of control for decades now. Returning to that uh, study of ocean sediments, this was a graph included in that paper, which is similarly concerning, showing um, here we have sediment plastic deposition over the decades back to 1950, uh, laid on top of world plastic production. They map perfectly. The more plastic we produce, the more the environment becomes contaminated with microplastics. And because sediments act as this really time capsule, we can look back and show just how badly the problem has got out of hand. Here's another one, layering uh, just one more layer of data. So those yellow, those lines of the yellow triangles, that was from a study of freshwater fish specimens. They actually went through uh, museum collections and dissected these fishes to find microplastic particles. And that gray dotted line is the same sediment study, um, but also the red one is plastic production, again, mapping perfectly. Those gray, those uh, lines of the triangles mapping perfectly as well, almost perfectly. Uh, we, as we have more microplastics in sediments, we have more microplastics in organisms. This is increasing exponentially. Uh, again, that is the astonishing urgency here to just turn down the top of microplastics into the environment because Organisms that might not be suffering now um, with, with microplastic contamination very well could be in five or 10 years if we don't get this problem under control. So, which brings into solutions. I want to end as happy as I can. Let's uh, go through a couple of these. Uh, top left uh, is a microfiber filter that's in my house. It's very easy to install. It collects a good amount of the microfibers that flush out of your washing machine before they go to a wastewater treatment facility, which again is sequestering 90% of microfibers in sludge and then spreading on fields or just powering the remaining 10% of it out to sea. So this is a, a good way to stop the microplastics really at the source. But again, I wanna emphasize that this is not an us problem. This should be on the manufacturers of washing machines 
to install these on every machine that comes off the line. And I'm not kidding when I say that every government should send these to their citizens free of charge, um, put a tax on the producers of, of washing machines and fund it that way. It'd be something like $5 billion to send every American household one of these things. They're not that expensive and it would go a long way to stopping the flow of microplastics into the environment. Below that is one of my favorite things of all time. That is Mr. Trash Whale. That's its actual name. It is a barge in Baltimore Harbor that collects uh, bottles and bags floating on the surface and puts it in a, a dumpster that then emptied out every once in a while. Keeping macroplastics, the bottles and the bags, from reaching the oceans will be huge because those are really just pre-microplastic. Um, any bottle and bag is going to fragment into smaller, smaller pieces over time and it becomes that much bigger of a problem. So putting these in rivers all over the world um, is going to be fundamental going forward for stopping both macroplastic pollution, the big stuff, and microplastic pollution. These don't capture obviously the small stuff, but they keep the big stuff from breaking the little stuff. Uh, top right is a very humble rain garden. I love these because they have a wide range of simultaneous benefits. So these are great for making cities more spongy, um, which is less impervious to, uh, surfaces like cement, more of the spongy infrastructure like dirt and grass that absorbs rainwater. And it also absorbs all those microplastics flowing off of uh, the roadside. Uh, it actually keeps them from getting down into uh, the sewers and, and into the ocean. In addition, these beautify a landscape. They also cool a landscape because greenery cools in an urban uh, environment. Multiple benefits at once. I love rain gardens, so do scientists. We should put them as many places as we can. And then just lastly, um, below, this is a, a device from a group called the Tire Collective, um, a group of actually very young folk who are putting together this Super interesting device that might attach to car tires. Um, and it actually collects the little bits of plastic that are flying off of them. Um, they told me they're actually speaking to, to uh, manufacturers of vehicles to potentially put these on them going forward. So there might be a day where you go to a mechanic, you know, you get your air filter replaced, but you also get your microplastic filters replaced as well. And again, that's going right to the source, not trying to capture these tire particles the closer they get to the ocean, but um, closer to where they're actually generated. Um, which is all not to say that anything short of stopping with all this goddamn plastic um, is going to work. Those well, smaller solutions are great. We should have them and we need them. There's no replacement for stopping with all the plastic. This image is insane. You don't have to be a biologist to know that cucumbers have their own skins. They're going to do perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Single-use plastic has gotten so crazy and so out of control um, that there's just really no way to escape it as a consumer. Uh, we need a global treaty, which they're working on, to cap plastics production, especially single-use plastic. The plastics industry is, of course, going to fight against that. They're going to try to water it down. Um, but here I am in California, we have some good legislation that is moving us away from single-use plastic. Typically what goes in California goes for elsewhere, other states follow suit. At the end of the day, we have to stop with all the plastic. Anything that's a bottle or bag is just pre-microplastic. Once it gets into the environment, it's going to break into smaller and smaller bits and get into smaller and smaller organisms and more and more nooks and crannies in the environment. And once it's out there, there's no pulling it out. Um, but I see, like to close on a little bit of optimism, I want to leave time for, for questions. I see a bit of a tide turning here where the public is, I think, coming to better terms with plastic as a, it's a toxicant. It's, it's toxic. It's terrible for human health. It's terrible for planetary health. The more studies that we get tying plastics in general, the, the plasticizer chemicals in them in particular to health problems. And in the next five, 10 years, hopefully we have better studies on the ways that microplastics are affecting human health. Maybe that, that helps to turn the tide against these sociopathic plastics companies that are drowning the planet in this stuff. That is, that is my hope that we can push back. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end on, I don't know, is that hopeful? Past hopeful um, and, and open it up to questions.
Thank you, Matt. Um, that was difficult, hopeful. There's hope, but uh, uh, this is gonna be tricky. Um, so thank you everyone for your attention and thank you for the questions we've had so far. Um, I wanna start with one question that's come up several times um, and that's about your the filter on your washing machine. So there's a question, how, how do these actually help? The filters need to be cleaned by users and whatever is caught in them goes into landfills. Are microplastics in landfills safer than if they were sent to wastewater treatment plants um, where they would probably, where 90% of them end up in, in sludge? It's a, it's a fantastic question. This comes up a lot with these mitigation measures. So the one that I have um, is actually a filter that you buy kind of in bulk. Uh, and then once you have used them, you ship them back to the company. Um, and they then turn those microfibers, I think, potentially into home insulation. So locking them away, hopefully, for longer. Um, that, of course, comes with other issues like that's emissions, right? Like paying for the shipping, paying to have these things come to your house and ship them back. That's not perfect. Um, and then, like I was mentioning with, with vacuum, vacuuming, like you can do everything you can to vacuum as much as you can, get as much of those particles off the floor. But then that's not guaranteeing that once you throw it in the trash can, at some point in the waste cycle, it's probably just going to take to the air anyway. If it's just thrown into a pit, um, the bag breaks open, out come the fibers that very easily take to the air. So this is a, this is a fantastic question. It's actually a, a big thing that these companies are they're, they're producing these mitigation measures are thinking about very hard. Like, how do we do this in a way that isn't just transferring the microplastics that should be flying out into the ocean through wastewater into some other medium like a, a landfill would then take to the air? Um, great. It's a great question and a, a big problem going forward. And it's going to, it'll work itself out, I think, as more and more companies come into this space. Um, but it's just one of those things that's so new that we just have to see how it develops. Oh, you're muted. Unless I lost Sorry audio. About that. Uh, no, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, one thing several people have asked, they'd really love to get the references um, that you cited in this presentation and where, um, find out where some of the um, the graphs came from. Would it be possible yes. to share that after the, the talk? Yeah, great. And I can send I it. I do have time. And that's actually one of the things I need to add to the presentation in general. I will, I will do that. Um, all of that came from citations in the book, so I can just go find those and give those to, to whoever needs it. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, and I'll send that out. Um, so what, uh, here's an interesting question, um, big picture. Um, are bioplastics a solution or part of a solution? I would love for bioplastics to be a solution, but they're in and of themselves, I think problematic in a couple of ways. So bioplastics are made not from fossil fuels, but from biology, from plants. Um, that's, that's where you get the carbon instead of, of fossil fuels. Um, to scale that up, to replace plastics made from fossil fuels would require an incredible amount of land and an incredible amount of water to grow all of those crops to make plastics. Um, is it better than fossil fuels? Probably, probably, yeah, but we are working on a planet with a growing population, a growing human population that needs the land it has to grow as much food as possible just to feed everybody. I think the second half of this is that bioplastics could potentially be a crutch for the plastics industry to say, here, we found this much better way of, of producing plastics. That gives them the excuse to produce plastics at the same scale that they do now, when really we just need to break that exponential curve of plastics production uh, in general, just stop using so much plastic, don't give them an excuse to, to produce more. Um, and the other thing is that there is virtually no toxicological data on, okay, well, when those bioplastics break down the environment, are they any better for organisms? They're made with the same plasticizers. Like it's a, it's a plastic with the same kinds of chemicals in a typical plastic. Uh, you're just getting the carbon from a, a different source. So there's, I mean, I think there'll be, in certain use cases, maybe bioplastics will be good. I don't think it will completely replace traditional plastics, um, but at scale, there are a number of problematic ecological issues. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, 
so I, I like the specificity of this question. So it, it, there are several parts and I can go through, we'll go, I'll read the whole thing and then go through piece by part by part. Are humans mostly exposed to microplastics through inhalation or consumption? Um, the second part is how concerned should we, the average citizen, be about biomagnification of these 10,000 plus chemicals found in microplastics through the food chain up to us humans? And then the third part, since so much microplastic has accumulated in our water bodies, would consuming less seafood lower our risk of bioaccumulating mi microplastic chemicals? Or is this a negligible concern compared to our exposure to microplastic on land and through the air? So starting with the first yeah, part, I, yeah, about which we would be more worried about, inhalation or consumption? It's inhalation because there is so much more of it in the air that we breathe and we're, we're constantly breathing, right? We're only eating and drinking part of the day. Um, these things are in such huge quantities in indoor air in particular, that there's no escaping them. That's, I think that's the scary part. It's like, even if you were to somehow avoid all microplastics in your food, um, you, you might do better, but there's, there's that one study that looked at, um, that actually quantified the amount of, of of microplastic in the food itself. And then said, we also actually measured what fell on the food as it was like at a dinner table. And it's virtually the same amount, if not more. So um, this, and, and I, to move to the biomagnification thing, I think is uh, a, an issue in the ecological aspect. So like if plankton are eating it, if bigger fish are eating those fish, if or those plankton and bigger fish are eating those, those fish on up the food chain, are you getting that biomagnification of these, these particles all the way up? Um, there is evidence showing, yes, that is happening for certain species. Um, but I keep coming back to this idea that you can reduce your consumption of seafood in a lot of ways you should, obviously, right? Like microplastic is a crisis layering on other crises for fish species, overfishing, warming seas, acidification, that sort of thing. Uh, microplastic is just one more thing. So yes, eat less seafood in general, um, but be much more aware of inhalation, I think. And that, I think that's where public health people are particularly concerned is that we know for a fact that no particulate matter is good to have in the, the lungs, um, much less ones that are made out of lots of known toxins. Okay, thank you. That's a really interesting perspective. I, I don't, I haven't heard, uh, despite all my reading about plastics. You might have, yeah, you might have heard like a, there's one calculation that you eat a credit card's worth every week or something. Um, yeah, that, yeah. There, there's no way to, there's no way to say that for sure. That very similar person to person, like if you eat a lot of packaged foods, I mean, this is a whole other thing that I probably should have mentioned in, in the presentation, but there's an equity angle to this as well. Like if you live in a food desert and you only have access to foods that are wrapped in a single use plastic instead of a farmer's market, you're exposed to more plastic. So like low income neighborhoods are now exposed to yet another thing, much more so than, than rich people are. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Matt. Um, in terms of one thing I'm really curious about is you're seeing a lot of products that are advertised, you know, made from recycled ocean plastic. Um, should we be really concerned about the, the health hazards of wearing anything on our bodies or kids playing with toys made from recycled ocean plastic? Or is it is it significantly worse than just playing with any other plastic toy or wearing any other plastic clothes? Yeah, I mean, I assume it would be, it's plastic, it's the same nasty stuff. Um, I, I think when we are talking about recycling plastic into other plastic goods, it's important to think about what's going to happen to that product um, at the end of its life. So there's a lot of talk about um, incorporating recycled plastic into roads, um, which is, of course, problematic because you're driving and abrading that plastic is just coming off as microplastic all the same. Um, so it's, you have emissions one way or the other. So uh, I think thinking more carefully about the end of the life of these, these plastic products, but also like during its life, it's shedding microplastics. We need to be much more conscious um, of what that means. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, an interesting question, uh, well, a bunch of interesting questions. Um, is there any evidence that in any species are adapting to plastics or microplastics? 
That's a, a great question. Uh, and something I didn't really touch on in the book, though I was thinking about it, there is some speculation that certain microbes might be adapting. So if you think back to the, the plastosphere uh, scanning electron microscope slides that I was showing, one of them actually shows these little microbes that have formed seemingly pits in the, the plastic. They might be in some way consuming the plastic. Um, there might be certain microbes that actually like microplastics. And you hear oftentimes about researchers finding this new microbe that actually eats plastic. It'll be great. It's going to solve the plastic crisis. Well, no, not unless you release vast quantities of this microbe into the environment, which is not particularly ecologically um, wonderful. Um, so, and the other thing that's that's an interesting kind of thought experiment is do species evolve in the presence of plastic? So um, in any sort of ecological ways, like do they evolve certain species that might be mistaken them for food? Do they evolve to stop doing that? Um, it's it's to be seen. I think we'll maybe see some of those studies in the coming years. It was more speculation, so I didn't put it in the book, but it's a great question. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, here's the question. Are there studies showing that fish have more plastic than chicken or beef? There has been way more studies finding plastic in fish because, again, microplastics research began in the oceans um, and only really moved on to land in recent years. There's only been a handful of studies I've seen on chicken, but there's one that was done, I believe, in Mexico where they, uh, it's actually quite fascinating design of the study. They sampled the soil and earthworms and fish that were feeding, or sorry, fish don't feed on earthworms, uh, chickens that feed on those earthworms and found that bioaccumulation actually. So uh, a lot of it in the soil, more of it in the earthworms, more of it in the chicken's guts. Whether or not that uh, translocates through the gut into the tissues, the muscle tissues that we eat um, is a harder question. It seems like Probably, I mean, it, it's almost certain that the stuff is when our in our guts, it's small enough to pass through the barrier, get into our other tissues. And that's one of the reasons we're finding it in so many different organs and in humans. Uh, but yes, it translocates through fish guts into fish muscles that we eat, but also think of like some fish species that we eat whole, like sardines or anchovies, um, but also filter feeders like clams. They are sucking in a lot of water and a lot of microplastics. You eat those whole, you're also eating those microplastics. But coming back to this idea that you're inhaling way more than you're eating. So I, I think less of a concern than, than what's in your lungs. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, and let's tackle one more question. I'll also add my internet is getting a little unstable. Um, so I'm missing some of the audio. So if I disappear um, after this question, um, that's why. Um, so question was, what do you see as the role of plastic manufacturers in getting plastics out of the ocean? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if they've started doing it yet. I assume they're going to put a lot of weight behind something like the ocean cleanup, um, which I have some problems with. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Waiting until the plastic is out in the ocean to, to pick it back up. I, again, love Mr. Trash Wheel. I think it's fantastic. Uh, the Ocean Cleanup Group actually has similar machines working in rivers to stop macroplastics closer to the, the source, closer to shore. Um, I, I'm extremely skeptical of anything the plastics industry is going to do um, because most of it, if not all of it, will be to the ends of just producing the same amount of plastic, if not more. Like if we can just pick it up out of the environment, no big deal, we'll just keep producing as much of it as we can. At the end of the day, we just need to stop using so much plastic. And that's a good thought to go out on. Thank you, Matt, so much for presenting today. Um, I wish you were happier news, but um, we're, mm. we're glad you're, you've pr you've packaged all this information and in such a making it so comprehensive and so readable and listen toable, as one of our readers who's listening to the audiobook pointed out. Um, we so appreciate you coming and and speaking to our group, um, and we. Hopefully, I suggest everyone give the book for Christmas or the holidays to friends and family. Um, and so, not to maybe... make your relatives sad, but yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> My next book will maybe be about puppies and kittens and that's good. You know, the nice uh, things. We'll see. 
Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, ever. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to everyone who participated today. We appreciate all the comments and questions and um, thoughts from all of you. And thank you for all of your work working for Ocean Health. All right, and thanks, Matt. We'll, we'll hopefully catch up with you um, sometime soon for your next book. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate okay. it. All right. Bye, everyone.